Good afternoon, everybody. We're just gonna let uh, wait a minute and let everybody in. <clears throat> Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, so why don't we begin? Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Daniel Reed, and I'm the Education Coordinator for the Holocaust Memorial in Miami Beach. And I want to thank you all for coming today to uh, uh, this program of Holocaust Education Week, which is something very special. It's a virtual tour of the Anne Frank House. And uh, I just want a few more, a few words about Holocaust Education Week. You know, this is a part of the uh, educational programming that the Holocaust Memorial does on an annual basis. And whether in person, when we're welcoming more than 100,000 visitors per year to the memorial, including more than 10,000 students, or virtually, the memorial dedicates itself to teaching adults and the next generation, the youth, to examine their own hearts to learn the lessons of what is right and to stand up against intolerance, bigotry, hatred, and anti-Semitism. So once normal life resumes, I do encourage you all to come by the Holocaust Memorial. We are still open to the public. So if you desire, you can come now as well. So this is a part of our Holocaust Education Week and we have uh, two more programs that are uh, coming this week. One is this afternoon at 3 p.m., which is a photographer's vision of the Holocaust in Poland with photographer Silvio Friedman, who will reveal an online exhibit of photographs that he took while visiting the concentration and death camps in Poland. And our concluding program tomorrow is something very special with Dr. Miriam klein kasanoff who is the uh, Holocaust Memorial's education chair. Um, she'll be telling the story of how her as a child Holocaust survivor and her family escaped through Nazi occupied Europe to freedom. So if you haven't registered for those two programs already, we do encourage you to do so. There still is time and we would love to host you as well. So this finally brings me to why we're all here this afternoon to uh, see a virtual tour of the Anne Frank house of the Anne Frank attic. And we have a lot of students online, so thank you for coming, and a lot of adult learners. Thank you for being here as well. Um, our guides today are Morgan Bailey and Aaron Peter. There's a lot that we can say about them, but in brief, Morgan is an educator who taught for three years with the Teach for America program and has previously volunteered with the Anne Frank House, but since 2018, she has worked for them full time uh, in a special capacity with the University of South Carolina on special educational uh, Holocaust projects. We also have with us today, Aaron Peter, who has worked for the Anne Frank House since 2002. And uh, Aaron, um, actually, I found something I found very interesting uh, is Austrian and did his national service as a volunteer at the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam. So he currently, he's one of the project managers for, in their educational projects department and has helped develop a number of exhibits and programs on Anne Frank in various settings in Western and non-Western cultural settings. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Morgan and Aaron and uh, our virtual tour is going to begin. Well, thank you very much for your generous introduction, Danny. Hello, uh, everybody. I'm Aaron from uh, the Educational Projects Department of the Anne Frank House and I'll be one uh, of the two tour guides today. Um, I am from Austria, but as Danny already said, I did my civil service or more the, over the uh, replacement of the civil service in the Holocaust Memorial, which was the Anne Frank House. That was many years ago. Um, usually I work a lot in the United States with the traveling exhibition Anne Frank, a history for today, where I um, train learners um, to become guides for the Anne Frank exhibition. And then um, learners take their peers through the exhibition and talk about 
the topics of the exhibition about the relevance of Anne Frank's story for us today. And um, usually I'm in the classroom together with my colleague Morgan, who is with me today. She's in South Carolina right now, but I'll just let Morgan say hi to you for herself. Hi, everybody. Uh, yes, my name is Morgan and I am in South Carolina, so not too far from all of you in Florida, but I'm very happy to be here with all of you today. I've been volunteering, uh, like Danny mentioned, with Anne Frank House Projects for many years now, was a teacher myself for a little while, and like Aaron said, Usually we get to travel to really great places like Florida and um, do projects with students in person, but of course that's not possible right now. So enjoying this time that we can connect virtually and looking forward to the time we'll be able to be back in person in classrooms, um, hopefully not too far in the future. Okay, well, um... We've asked Danny to share a link with you, a link to a video that we use in our workshops. Um, the documentary is called The Short Life of Anne Frank. And we trust that most of you have seen this uh, documentary. Um, to start our uh, guided tour through the secret annex, we'd like to begin with a short Mentimeter brainstorming activity. So if you're sitting behind your desktop or laptop uh, right now, or if you have your mobile devices, please go to www.menti.com and punch in the code 5873567. And we have one question for you. And this question is, what do you know about Anne Frank? Now, imagine that you would be talking to one of your peers and uh, you would tell him or her, hey, um, I followed this uh, VR guided tour um, with Morgan and Aaron, um, was about Anne Frank. And what is this one thing that you would tell your peers about Anne Frank? Something that you would like to share. What do you know about Anne Frank? So let's see if we're getting some answers. Yeah. She was German. Yeah. She was brave. She is Jewish. Exactly. So Jewish young. In the Holocaust at a young age. Yeah. She documented her hiding. Exactly. So this is a unique um, document that we have, her diary. She wanted to be a writer, that's true. Courageous and a journalist, yep. She had a sister, exactly, yeah. Inspirational, positive, Secret Annex. Good person. Her sister was Margot. Died in Bergen-Belsen. Yeah, exactly. Concentration camp in Germany. Poet writer, nice and caring. She hid in an attic. That's right. Now, the attic was also part of the hiding place, actually. Yep. Y'all know a lot. Exactly. And lots of different things as well. My God. That's <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much for sharing your comments. You know, you can still keep on writing your comments. We already have 124 comments and counting. Um, but let me, for now, take you somewhere else. And I'd like to start 
with a picture. Now this here is an aerial shot in Amsterdam of the Jordaan, which is a, you know, a historic part of the city of Amsterdam. And what we see here is actually the Vesta Markt with the Vesta Church and the clock tower. And then in this turquoise highlight, this is actually what we know today as the Anne Frank House. Now, you know, Amsterdam is actually really famous for its canals. Yeah, they also call it Venice of the North. Now, this canal here is the Prinzengracht, Prinzen Canal, and this canal over here, the Kaisersgracht. Yeah? And the secret annex and the Anne Frank House today was exactly located here on Prinzengracht number 263. And right behind here, some of you might recognize the chestnut tree, right? That became a symbol of hope for Anne and the other people in hiding. Now, why was this the perfect hiding place? Yeah. Now, if you would stand just in front of Prinzengracht number 263, you would not see the back part of the house or the back house. Now, this is really something special about Amsterdam. You know, about 400 years ago, when this building and the other buildings were, were built, um, people in Amsterdam who built houses here were taxed on the width of their houses, yeah, because there was not a lot of space to build your house on. So what happened was that owners were taxed on the width of their houses, which means people tended to build their very narrow houses, very high houses. And then if they needed extra space, yeah, they would create a halo in between two houses and then another house in the backyard or you know, into the garden. And this is why you have a front house and a back house, right? So standing over here or in front of Prinzengracht number 263, you would not see the back house. You would not see the hiding place. You know? And something else here that I will add as well is that sometimes words can get lost in translation and can be kind of hard for us to understand. And sometimes in this story and this history, we hear that Anne Frank hid in an attic. And in certain parts in the US, attic is usually used to refer to the space that's above your house. It's not finished, it doesn't usually have heat or air. And so a lot of people think that Anne Frank was in hiding in an attic above another space. But the more direct translation, like you've heard Aaron say, is actually annex. So the space where she was in hiding was this extra part of a building behind an existing building, not necessarily just an attic above a house, if that makes sense. All right. Now, we'll... So again, this is Prinzengracht number 263. And actually the entire building that was used by Otto Frank, you know, and Frank's father and his companies you know, that were established in Prinzengracht number 263. Our VR tour today will take you to the secret bookcase into the secret annex. And we'll be mainly exploring these three floors, the first floor, the second floor, and the attic of the secret annex. Now, let me start right here. Now, the special thing about the VR tour is that you can actually see what it used to look like when Anne Frank and the other seven people were in hiding. Yeah. So, back in the days, how would you enter the, the back house? Now, you would walk up this staircase, yeah, and Anne calls it the long neck breaking staircase because if you see it in real life, you know, you will really know that it's really steep. And if you fall down, you know, you can imagine that you would break a leg or an arm. And you would then walk over here and you would only see this revolving bookcase. Yeah? And on top of the bookcase, a map of the kingdom of Belgium, which would conceal the top part of the door. So if anybody would come through the front part of the house, get lost and end up in the back part of the house, he or she would only see this bookcase. 
Now, these windows, if you would look through those windows, you would actually see the back house were covered with glass paper. So with it was this. There were lots of boxes, you know, files, storage, spices over here. And the idea was, let's tell people if they get lost, well, you know, we got it blacked out because we keep spices here, yeah, for instance. And then what the, the Nazis, you know, who occupied the Netherlands at that time actually were carrying out in 1942 already, house to house rage. They were searching for bikes. So just in case somebody would come into the back house yeah, and actually stand in front of that door, you know, this was a decoy. So of course it was used, but this was the entrance to the secret annex. And today, if you walk through the museum, there's a glass plate here. So you can look down, you cannot walk through there. And the museum route would take you through this door, the front part to the bookcase and you would walk through the bookcase. All right, are there any questions at this point in the chat about this area, about the bookcase? I'm looking here and I see that there are some broad questions, but not specifically about this. So maybe we save those for the end. Perfect. Now, Morgan will take you into the actual secret annex. All right, so we are going to go through this bookcase here. And this is where we land. So you remember that Aaron mentioned that there are two stories and then there's another little attic place above that we're going to look at. So we're gonna stay on the first floor for now, but I'll give you a quick look around to see what it looked like when you came through the bookshelf. So this is the door that we would have just come through. We'll come through this one in a minute, but for now, we're gonna go this way. So this room was the bedroom of Otto and Edith Frank and also Margot Frank. Now, these people were Anne's parents, Otto and Edith. This was their bed here. And Anne had a big sister. I saw you were talking about that earlier when we got started. And she slept here. Now, I'll tell you, or Aaron actually will tell you a little bit more about uh, why we, why Margot was sharing this room with her parents. In just a second, you'll see, see more about that. But for now, I will tell you that originally the plan was not for Margot to share this room. This was supposed to have just been the parents' room. And then after they went into hiding, one of the helpers, her name was Nee Peace, she had a dentist who was Jewish. And that dentist, his name was Fritz Pfeffer. And he went to Meep and he knew she was a good person. And he said, Meep, I really need a place to go into hiding. I really think I need, I need to, to, to go. And I don't know where to go. Is there anyone or anywhere that you know of that could help me? And she said, well, let me see what I can do. And so she came here to the people who were in hiding and said, I, I have this you know, acquaintance, he's my dentist, and he needs a place to hide. And what Otto Frank said was essentially, if we can have seven people here, we can have eight people here. And over the course of this tour, we're gonna to talk a little bit more about the rest of those people. But when that addition was made, it meant that some people had to move around. And so Margot Frank ended up moving into this room and sharing it with her parents. Now, something that always stands out to me when I look at this tour is a couple of things. One, we can see all of this furniture in here. And that's actually really special and really unique because if and when you visit the Anne Frank house for yourself, you walk through it and it's totally empty of any furniture. And the reason for that really goes back to Otto Frank or Anne's father. Now, he was the only person who survived that was staying in this hiding place. 
And after the war, after the liberation, he had been in Auschwitz. He eventually made his way back to Amsterdam and he came into this space and he walked into the place where he and his family had been in hiding for over two years. And it was totally empty because all of the furniture in the place had been stolen, basically. It had all been taken away because Jewish people weren't respected. And so property rights of Jewish people were not respected. And so if they found Jewish people, their things would just be taken away. And so this space was totally empty when Otto came back. And so he decided that if and when this space would become a museum, he wanted it to stay empty, kind of as a tribute in memorial to the way he had found it. So basically he knew that one day Amsterdam was going to move on from this period of time called the Holocaust, that Europe was going to move on. Life was going to get back to normal one way or another. But he liked the idea that there'd be some place that just kind of stayed frozen in time almost. So people could come back and step back in time and see what this place was like back then when he came back and found it empty. Something else that stands out to me is that I have to think about what it must have been like to pack your bags, knowing you were gonna go into hiding, right? When you think about the fact that they knew they could go into hiding for a really long time, they didn't know how long it was going to be and they couldn't carry a whole lot of things. That tells me that every single little thing that you see in this place was really important and really special and was chosen for a reason. And so an example we can see here of that are the prayer books of Anne's mother, Edith. Now, just like in pretty much any family uh, or in any society, some people will be more religious than others. And Edith, Edith Frank was a religious woman. Her Jewish faith was very important to her. She went to synagogue almost every week and her daughter Margot went with her most of the time. Otto, not so much. He wasn't quite as religious and Anne kind of went along mostly with her dad. So they went to synagogue on special holidays, um, maybe when it was really important to their mom, but for the most part, they weren't as religious as Edith was. But one of the things that Edith wanted to bring into hiding with her was her prayer books because they were very, very important to her. And then before we move on, I will show you a couple of more things. Now, these are actually still on the wall. So when you go to Amsterdam and you go to the Anne Frank house, you can still see some of these things on the walls that are really special. So this is a map that shows where the allied troops had landed and were advancing in a place called Normandy. And Otto Frank knew that these were the people who were basically coming to save them from the Nazis, right? That they were the good guys, if you will. And so he listened to where they were located as they were progressing. And he made, um, or he used these pins that you see here to mark where they were, hoping and waiting for the day that they would get to Amsterdam. And he listened to this information on the radio. And then one last thing in this place that to me is the most moving out of the whole entire tour shows the height of Anne and Margot as they grew up over these two years. Anne grew a lot. She grew 13 centimeters. Margot, not so much because she was a few years older. And so she had already had that growth spurt. But to me, this is just so moving to see in person and in this tour here because it's such a reminder that this was just a normal family. It's so normal for parents to track the height of their kids as they grow. And so this just reminds me that Anne Frank and her sister Margo were just normal girls trying to live their life as normally as they could in such crazy circumstances. So now Erin is gonna take us into the next room. Okay, thank you, Morgan. Now, this room here is also very special. And if you take a look around, you will actually recognize different things, especially on the wall, that first of all show you, hey, this must be a room of a 
kid of a teenager. And you're totally right. Actually, you see all those pictures on the wall, right? Now these pictures or posters were put up by Anne. And it does really remind me of the posters that I put up when I was a kid. I used to put up pictures, you know, of famous musicians, uh, Hollywood movies. And later on, when my, I would say, interests changed, you know, I put up pictures and posters of NBA players, for instance. And Anne actually did the same thing, you know. When Anne went into hiding, the helpers, which we will talk about later on more, um, brought magazines and books into the secret annex for the for the people who lived there and and really loved cinema and theater which was also the name of one of these magazines she would receive and also a dutch women's journal called libelle yeah and she would cut out images and pictures that she liked and put them up on the wall and what we have noticed or what we can see is that when Anne, you know, when she went into hiding, she was 13 years old, um, she put up, as she called them herself, well, a childish prince, right? But then when she got older, when she was 14, yeah, going towards 15, she thought, hey, this was childish. So I'm actually more interested into art. Yeah? So we see here, uh, self, the self-portrait of Leonardo da Vinci, and and just you know cut it out and 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 put it on top of this childish print, and this is where it is still today. So all these pictures were put there by Anne, and most of them are still there. You know they have survived um, the the years. Now what else is in this room? This here, the actual diary. You know, this was Anne's best friend. She called her diary Kitty. You know, the, the letters she wrote to her best friend into the diary, all the entries start with Dear Kitty. So that's her diary. You might recognize the, the jacket um, cover of it. And then we got two beds in here. And before, Morgan was talking about a dentist that shared the room with Anne. Well, we have one bed here. That was Anne's bed. And if you look carefully, you see a chair. And this chair was put there because, you know, Anne's legs and feet were sticking out of the bed. So she needed more space. So she used that chair, you know, to rest her feet on it. And this here is actually a dentist drill, you know, a very old dentist drill. Now, over here, Mr. Fritz Pfeffer, the dentist, stayed you know and him and Anne didn't get on well with each other now basically before Mr. Pfeffer joined the people in hiding that was in November and Anne and her family um, uh, actually entered the hiding place in, in July of 1942 when they went into hiding Anne shared the room with Margot but then when Mr. Fritz Pfeffer also came to the hiding place Anne's parents thought, now we need space, but we cannot have Margot, you know, who was three years older than Anne, who is a woman, to share the room with a grown up man. But Anne, she's still a kid. So it's definitely easier for her to share the room with Mr. Pfeffer. And Anne and Mr. Pfeffer, they were fighting a lot, actually, about small things, but also about very important things for Anne. For instance, who gets time to use the little desk? Is it Fritz to study his languages you know, while in hiding? Or was it Anne to write into a diary? Uh, they got into each other's nerves. And Anne also writes that and describes her fights in, in the diary. By the way, she describes all the fights and all the details that were going on. I mean, you must imagine for more than two years, eight people shared this hiding place with each other. So. When Anne was rewriting her diary to keep a record what was, of what was happening to her and the other people in hiding, she gave the people in hiding different names. 
and Mr. Fritz Pfeffer got the name of Albert Dussel. Now, Dussel is a German word. It's not used anymore, actually, but Dussel means idiot. So actually, Anne called Mr. Fritz Pfeffer Albert uh, Dussel. Yeah? So this is what she thought of, of, uh, of her roommate, basically. So when you visit the Anne Frank house today and you walk through this room and you come in here, you will actually still find the posters and pictures that Anne Frank put up onto the wall. Yeah. And this is something, you know, that we often talk about, Morgan and I, in our workshops with our students, you know, well, was Anne Frank that saint? Was she that perfect girl? You know, what makes her so special? And believe me, you know, Anne Frank, she was very special, but she was also a very, very normal girl, a very normal teenager, you know. The way she wrote in her diary, for instance, about Mr. Dusso, but she also writes about her mom, you know. We know that she didn't get on too well with her mom, but she thought her dad was the greatest sweetheart ever. But she put some words into the diary about her mom saying, my mom is definitely a role model for me, but a role model for how I do not want to be, which is not really nice. But hey, this is a diary. This is her best friend and you don't lie to your best friend. And, and this is something that makes her so special as well. You know, she's so honest and it also makes it possible for us to relate to her, you know. Okay. Now we'll leave Anne's room. Morgan will take over in another very important room which is the bathroom of the secret annex. All right. Now it may be easy to overlook how important this room is, but I will tell you that so many people who went into hiding during this time in history had to go into hiding with places that did not have a bathroom or running water. Oftentimes people went into hiding in uh, barns in the country, even sometimes in, in fields. And so having a, a bathroom in this privacy is actually really special. And at one point in the diary, Anne even describes their hiding place as the Taj Mahal of hiding places, basically saying that this is as good as it could possibly get. But something that I think is an important lesson that we can learn from Anne is that it's possible for two um, realities to be true at once that may seem like they're opposites. So what I mean by that is, Anne said they were so lucky. They were so lucky to have um, the space that they did to, um, to be together. So often when families went into hiding, they had to separate and children went one place, parents went another, the children would have to go to different places sometimes. And they were able to be together as a family. And she was thankful for that, even though, yes, she did fight with her, her family sometimes. But at the same time, being in hiding and not being able to live your life for two years is so much harder than any of us can really wrap our minds around. It's more challenging than we can describe. And so at the same time, she knew that she was fortunate, but she also knew that she was in a really tough spot. And both of those things can be true sometimes at the same time. Now, one important thing to note about the bathroom here and the toilet is that they couldn't use it whenever they wanted to. Now, we talked about how this hiding place is in like an extra back little um, small house almost. And so I'll show you here quickly that the first two floors actually go from the front house to the back house. And so the people were in hiding here and the helpers that we're gonna talk more about in just a minute mainly worked in offices in the front part of the house. But this down here was where a lot of other workers worked, um, a warehouse, a place where the uh, workers were producing the product that this company made and they did not know anyone was in hiding above them. So they had to be very, very quiet during the day. And that included when you could flush the toilet because the bathroom was here. So you can see the pipes, if you flush the toilet, would run straight down through the warehouse here. 
And so you have to think, okay, so people are working down here and they hear a toilet flush. They probably don't think anything of it, right? Like that's a normal noise. But what if they hear it flush over and over and over again? And they're thinking to themselves, man, there's only four people who work upstairs. I mean, how often are they going to the bathroom, right? But then what we also have to remember is that this wasn't a normal time in history. And people, uh, Jewish people were going into hiding uh, very frequently. And there was actually rewards that would be given for betraying or turning in Jewish people in hiding. So that meant that someone could get paid money for reporting Jews in hiding. So they could not flush the toilet too much because they wanted to be very sure that these pipes and walking around and running around and being loud, that nothing would give anyone any suspicion because any suspicion meant someone could just pick up the phone and call and say, hey, I think there are Jews hiding at, at where I work. And if that were true, they would get a lot of money. So they had to make sure to not give any reason for anyone to be suspicious. Now, we also know that Anne was a young teenager while she was in hiding. So she was going through all kinds of changes hormonally and her body and her mind as she was growing. We saw the chart where she grew so much. And so having this privacy where she could close the door and get away from people was really, really important. Also, just thinking about being at that age, I know some of you are teenagers and 13, 14, 15 years old right now. And I remember when I was that age, sometimes I just wanted to get away from my family and close the door. But you saw that Anne had to share a room with this grown man that she didn't even really like. So her opportunities for privacy were really, really limited. So it made her appreciate this room and also another space we're gonna see in just a second. So I will take us out this door and give you a glimpse of where we just came from, right? So we've done the full loop of the first floor now. And Aaron is going to now take us up these stairs and show us the second floor. Exactly. Now, welcome back. We're now in the second floor of the secret annex. And one more thing that Morgan said before, you know, about the pipes that ran through the entire house and also the, the basement of the back house. Now, I used to work um, um, in the actual place, you know, uh, in Amsterdam. And I used to, you know, guide visitors through the museum. And sometimes, you know, I was the last one to walk through the house. And when I was kind of like approaching the hiding place, you know, and standing, for instance, in Anne's room, I could actually hear people on top in this room walking around. You know? So I could hear every footstep. And this is also what Anne Frank writes in her diary, you know, that you can hear everything that happens in the back house. Now, this here was actually the largest room of the secret annex. You know? And it was the bedroom of the Van Pels family, Augusta and Herman Van Pels, you know, at night. So we saw two beds over there. But then it was also the dining room for all eight people in hiding. We see eight chairs around the table. And it was also the kitchen. Okay. So this is where people in hiding would have their breakfast, lunch, and dinners. But they would also have their anniversaries and, and holidays being celebrated in this room together with the helpers. And in a second, I'll let you know who those helpers were, but you know, for instance, Mipris, you know, one of the helpers and, and Anne's favorite helpers um, for her wedding anniversary, her first wedding anniversary, Mip, her husband Jan and the other four helpers came in to celebrate with the people in hiding. What did Anne do? Anne actually created a menu on the typewriter um, that described, you know, what was on the menu on that very special day. So the helpers at times came into the secret annex to spend time with the people in hiding, you know, to share news from what was happening in Amsterdam, what was happening 
to friends of the Frank family, to acquaintances. And unfortunately, very often, there were also reporting of deportations, you know, of uh, um, Jews in Amsterdam being deported and being brought to those camps um, in, in uh, the north of Holland and eventually to the east of Europe. So who are those helpers? Now, Anne Frank and the other people in hiding, you know, for the more than two years that they were there, they could not leave Prinzengracht number 263 to go out and do groceries. So you need helpers, of course. Yeah? Those helpers, six of them, would supply the people in hiding with food, you know, with vegetables, with meat, with everything they would need to survive. And now we would think, of course, helpers, but think about that time, you know, what does that mean? Well, first of all, the Frank family went into hiding a day after Margot got her call up yeah, to go and register for one of these camps, which meant that the preparation for the hiding place was going on for quite some time, but then the family really went into hiding. So they resisted. Margot resisted this call up. So Jews who went into hiding were actually seen as criminals, right? So if you would help Jews in hiding, you would help criminals. Yeah? And at that time, you would get punished. And now this is something that we talk about a lot with our students in our workshops. You know, well, what does it mean to help? You know, if you help people, in this situation, you know, there are lots of things you have to fear for their life. You have to fear for your own life of being caught. You know, it's very, very time consuming. You know, in these times of war, um, you couldn't just buy food. You know, you had to use food stamps, for instance, to get food for so many people. You had all this responsibility. But what do we know about those helpers, all of whom survived the war? When Otto Frank asked them if they would help him, everybody immediately said yes by all means you're our friends you're in need you need help we we can help you we can provide you with everything that you need so they did not hesitate so although it was very very risky yeah, and although they could have been caught you know they could have ended up in prison or or even worse they still thought it was the most normal thing to do. They did not want to be seen as heroes. They just needed, they just wanted to help their friends. You know? Our friends needed help. And this is something that is really special about the story of Anne Frank as well. You know, you see this humanity, you help other people because they need help. You know? So up here, the kitchen, by the way, the sink is actually still there, yeah. But as we already talked about before, all the furniture has gone. A personal item here. This is like a, a, um, a Dutch version of Monopoly, you know. So Peter Van Pels received this board game on his 16th birthday. This is his birth, first birthday that he celebrated in the Secret Annex. So in here. Herman and Auguste van Pels. And Morgan will welcome you in the last room um, of the secret annex that belonged to one of the, the people in hiding, who was Peter van Pels. All right. So, our last formal room of the tour is Peter's room. Now, Peter was like Aaron mentioned, the son of Herman and Augusta. Now, Peter, if you've read the diary, you know already that he and Anne had a very special relationship. When Anne first came to, when they all first came into hiding together and were getting to know each other, Anne writes that she thought Peter was very boring. He was a dull boy. He was not very interesting to her. And then later on, she realizes that actually he was just shy and he really wasn't that boring, but that she just really didn't know him very well. So they get to know each other and they do have this very special romance. They 
share their first kiss while they're in hiding. And it's a really exciting time for Anne while she's in hiding. Now, eventually, as can happen, Anne's feelings start to fade a little bit and she decides that she needs to focus more on her writing. And she decides that she really does not want to be in this romantic relationship with Peter anymore. So it just kind of fades. But uh, Peter is a very special person who is in hiding with Anne. And some people look at this and they say, okay, well, why did Peter get his own room? This doesn't seem fair. Anne had to share a room with this grown man. I mean, why couldn't um, that grown man had, had been here and Peter been with his parents or people always have lots of suggestions for how they would have done things. But a couple of things to keep in mind. One, it's hard for us to say what should have been done in a time when we have no idea what it was actually like to be there. So we can't really say what we would or wouldn't have done. But something else important to keep in mind is that this little attic, I'll give you a really quick, quick glance at it. There were sometimes rats up here in this attic. And sometimes those rats would come down here into this room. And everyone else said, nope, I do not wanna stay in this room with these rats, but Peter's a teenage boy, he will be just fine. But Peter also had a cat who could catch these rats. And so it just made sense that Peter and his cat shared this room and they could help take care of this rat problem that they had. One other thing I'll point out to you here is this bicycle. Now, Amsterdam is, like I mentioned earlier, Aaron was mentioning, a really special, a really beautiful city. And you can't go to Amsterdam without noticing that bikes are so important. There are way more bikes than even people. Lots, most people um, travel by bike every single day. A lot of people don't even have cars. They just use bikes. And so when they went into hiding, Peter wanted to, of course, bring his bike with him and he cared for it very well. You can kind of see that there's this brown paper wrapped around parts of it to keep it safe. Now, at some point while they were in hiding, food and money and resources were running low. And they had to talk about trying to sell some of their items to make money. And so it was actually tried um, that they would sell Peter's bike. Uh, the helpers would, would take it and, and try to sell it. But unfortunately, they weren't able to get a um, fair price for it because, you know, people that even weren't Jewish, weren't in hiding, were very poor. There was a major depression. The winters were incredibly difficult and everyone was really poor during this time. And so when they tried to sell this bike, there wasn't anyone who had the resources to, to be able to buy it. So it ended up not being sold. Now, one other thing I'll point out to you here is that today this wardrobe is actually not here. So we talked about those staircases and how narrow they were. So today, if you were to go to this museum and try to go up that staircase and other people were trying to come down it, people would be falling all over themselves. So what was actually done is they did a construction project where they actually added a walkway here. I saw someone ask the question about the front of the house. And yes, the front of the house is also used as part of the museum. And so when you go today, that um, little wardrobe I showed you isn't there. There's a walkway and you go here. And then the tour um, takes you through this section and talks about what happened after they were caught and arrested. And from here, I will turn it back over to Aaron. Okay. And Finally now, thank you, Morgan. Um, before we uh, go to your questions, just a quick look up into the attic. Now the attic wasn't really a room that somebody you know, used for him or herself. Basically, the attic was used mainly you know, for storage purposes, for all the you know, um, food that you know, could stay for a long time that was kept up in the attic, but also, it was windy up there. The attic wasn't insulated. Um, in winter, it would be extremely cold. Morgan already talked about the rats, right? So nobody really used the attic to 
kind of lived there, but still Peter and Anne, it was really special to them because this is where their sh they shared their first kiss, right? And Anne writes about that first kiss in her diary. Something else about the attic, um, if you have a look here, you see there is like, well, there are two stories in those attic, yeah, in this attic. And there was a little window up here from where um, the people in hiding had a beautiful um, um, outlook to the church, to the Vesta care, you know, that we showed you right in the beginning uh, with this aerial shot. And finally, this window out there, which has this magnificent view onto the chestnut tree, all right? This chestnut tree, which is not, unfortunately, not there anymore. But this chestnut tree was a symbol of hope for N and also for the other people in hiding. So today we have saplings of that chestnut tree all over the world, you know, also in the US. So still a very, very special place, the attic up here. Um, I'm gonna stop here because we do wanna be, you know, we do wanna take questions that you might have right now. So I'm gonna stop the sharing and, um, Turn it over to you, Danny, for the moment. Okay. So, um, Morgan um, and Aaron, thank you so much for that amazing presentation. We do have a few questions. And before we start to answer some of the questions in the Q&A, there is one question from uh, some students from uh, Pembroke Pines Charter Middle School. And they were kind enough to email me them before. But, but if, can you guys talk for a couple of minutes uh, about what happened to Anne Frank and her family after they were arrested and, and also how long were they in the attic please mention that should, should i go morgan do you want to go go ahead aaron all right now in total they spent 761 days up in the attic yeah? so just over two years um july 6 42 till august 4th 1944 um now, the entire, everybody in the secret annex, you know, the Frank family, the Van Pels family, and also Fritz Pfeffer, they were arrested, uh, brought to prison in Amsterdam, from there deported to the, a transit camp, Westerbork, in the north of the Netherlands, and actually put on the last train that ever left the Netherlands for the extermination camps in the east of Europe, right? So the only person of the people in hiding that survived the concentration camps and who returned to Amsterdam was uh, Otto Frank. And upon his arrival, when um, it became clear that his family, his wife, and, and especially his two daughters um, um, did not survive the concentration camps, Nipchis, so Anne's favorite helper, gave the diary that she and, and Bep um, saved to Otto. So they kept them, but all the other uh, people in hiding perished in the concentration camp. Okay, thank you, Aaron. Um, one question that's asked is, is uh, I've seen it a couple times, is, is what happened to the, the Nazis that, uh, that arrested the, the Anne Frank family? Can, and I, can you explain who arrested them? And has there been any research into what happened or to them after the war, were they found? Sure, so this is definitely the most common question. People all wanna know um, who betrayed the Frank family no. and um, which is related to, to what you were, were saying there. And um, the short answer to that is that we still don't know. Um, we of course know who uh, the head officer was who showed up to actually arrest them. Um, his name was Silberbauer. Uh, he was actually Austrian, uh, but how he found out and how it was actually reported to the police is still a mystery. There are lots of theories about this. Um, it could have been, you know, we showed you how the warehouse um, at the very bottom, um, potentially people working there heard noises and, and reported it. Um, you know, it could have been a cleaning person who heard something and then told someone. It, there are 
so many theories about this, but we just don't know. Um, we do know that there are always people looking into this. Um, and so maybe one day more information could come out about this, but for now, um, it's still a mystery. Well, and actually, Morgan, if I can add to that, Carl Josef Silberbauer from Vienna um, in the 1960s, you know, became apparent uh, that, that he was the officer in charge of the arrest, but uh, he was never prosecuted, you know, and, um, uh, you know, also what, what we know of Otto Frank, you know, uh, what he uh, told us, because Otto Frank, he was an officer in the First World War for Germany. So, so when the police actually uh, raided the place and and um, saw uh, basically a wooden box that would belong to a, to an officer in the First World War, you know, they were thinking like, "Hey, are we arresting the right people?" But they actually just carried on, you know. But the, the people who were in charge of the arrest, you know, and especially Karl Josef Silberbauer, he was um, never prosecuted. All right, thank you. There's there's a couple questions about. Uh, I know you explained that today, that uh, if we if you visited the 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 actual annex, uh, it would be empty. Um, but there are a couple questions about. Uh, did when Otto Frank came back, did uh, you said that the furniture was stolen? But was anything recovered? Um, and how do you how did you reconstruct uh, the three D images? That how did you know that that is what it that, that is what it looked like? Well, you know that you know actually when when Otto came back, you know there were everything that was of value, you know, to this company who raided the place, who, a moving company, which was called Pulse, you know, and they, 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 you know, moved, I think, somewhere between 25 and 30,000 uh, places only in Amsterdam, you know, where, where Jews were, would live, you know, and then deported, but they would take everything that was of value, you know, so obviously, writings, you know, they just neglected them. This is how they were, were saved. But when Otto Frank came back um, and eventually, you know, the idea of the museum um, was born, you know, he always said, hey, um, um, I want people, you know, when they see this, because, it's, you know, to, to feel the same emptiness that I felt when I came back. And, and it is not only a museum. It is, it is, it is also a memorial, you know, where, and you will experience the same thing, you know, people go there, you know, and reflect and, and, and think about lots of things, you know, and not just walk around and have a look at every um, uh, little item. What was the second part of the question again? Well, um, also was, was anything ever, uh, ever recovered or was he able to trace down anything? Um, no, not, not in terms of the furniture, for, you know, but a couple of years ago, um, Anne used to play with marbles, you know, and those marbles were recovered. Yeah. So, so they're, they're in the museum today. So if you go there today, you can actually see them on, on display. And um, I think we have time for, for one last question. Um, a couple of people have asked, uh, you, know, you mentioned and you showed in the diagram that uh, the front part of the house today is also a museum. Uh, you know, can you talk a couple minutes about uh, like how many how many people uh, visit the museum and what uh, what they would see? And uh, do people come from all over the world uh, to do it, to see it? Yes, the, the short answer 100% is yes. Uh, it's getting, I think, close to 2 million people a year. Is that right, Aaron? Well, uh, last year, you know, through? we had 1.3 million visitors last year. And um, growing every year. <laughs> exactly. This year, you know, we will take this hit because of Corona and the museum was actually closed and it's closed as we speak right now. But yes, many, many, many people. And, you know, the, the kind of setup, you know, when you, you do not only um, visit the house of Prince and Gracht number 263, you know, um, let me bring back this image here. So today the entrance of the museum is over here and um, you would walk through all of those houses actually, you know, that are, you know, part of the museum. 
and it's a chronology that takes you with an audio guide into Prinzengracht number 263 and finally into the, the secret annex. So it's a real maze, you know, and what Morgan said before in Peter's room, the, the, the cupboard that's not there anymore, the closet, actually this is where um, a tunnel takes you, a glass tunnel back into the front part of the house, right? So it's really this maze you walk through and you do not only see Prinzengracht number 263, you know, you'll walk through other parts of, of this block as well. Mm -hmm. And you were asking about people coming from all over the world. And that was something that was really close to Otto Frank's heart as well, because after the diary was published, people, uh, especially young people, would write him letters saying how much they related to Anne and appreciated her message of hope and resilience. And he realized that it wasn't just Jewish people who could connect to this because there are people all over the world who are experiencing different kinds of discrimination and prejudice and, and hard times for various reasons. And he realized that people could really connect to her and appreciated her story. And she was an inspiration for a lot of people. And so you see that in the museum as well, because you see people flying from all over the world to, to come and see this space. Oh, that's wonderful. So just really quickly, do you uh, know how, um, off, offhand um, how many copies of Anne Frank's diary uh, have been sold and in how many languages it's been published? Well, it, it, it's been published in, I think we're over 70 languages. And, you know, it's one of the, um, the, the most read books in the world, actually, you know. So mm -hmm. some of the, the it's, it's hard to get hard statistics on that, but oftentimes you'll see um, some sources say that it's been the second most read uh, book after the Bible. That uh, that I can understand. You don't know how many uh, it's a, a standard in Florida in most schools in Florida that uh, that students, especially either in middle school or elementary school, read read Anne Frank. So uh, Morgan and Aaron, I want to thank you so much on behalf of uh, the Holocaust Memorial Miami Beach and the Florida Department of Education and um, all of us who were enriched by this last hour and got to, to view uh, a little bit of, um, of the world of Anne Frank and her family and the others that were in, in the annex. Um, I really, really appreciate it. I hope everybody else got, uh, got something out of it as well. And um, I will be uh, sending a follow-up to everyone uh, with more information about, uh, about the Anne Frank uh, House and what they do. And thank you very much. I really, really do appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for having us. All the best Thanks to so everybody. Much.